com and just kind of get in place. They're going to sit uh, at the top of the steps here, and they're just going to tell you about, uh, take a few minutes and tell you about our journey. Now, while they are getting in place, I want to just talk to you about the, uh, the missions trip programs that we have here at Generations Church. We usually do try to do one construction trip uh, per year. And uh, we completed one in Honduras in April. If you were part of that team, would you raise your hand? We got a good number of those uh, folks that were in here. And another trip that we do, we call it an intro trip. It's an introductory trip that is it's primarily, but not necessarily, for people that have never been on a missions trip before. So it, it's not a really, really heavy schedule. There are nice hotels, nice food. I want you to have a good experience. You're on your very first missions trip, and the intro, so intro is, is prayer. Uh, we do a lot of praying, prayer walking. We do observation. We watch. We tour. We see what other ministries are are doing, uh, we observe, and then we also participate. So I'll be announcing the next couple of weeks where our intro trip is for next October. So we're, I'm already working on that. I want to finalize some of the details. So if you've never been on one, never been on a missions trip, I want you to consider either the, the one to Peru if you're into construction or if you'd like something a little bit different nature, consider the one that we'll take in October. And once I get all that finalized, we'll let you know um, about the details. Well, this was our Spain team, and as you can see, they have one common characteristic, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this was my first all-female trip, um, <laughs> but uh, God has been preparing me. Let's, let's keep the lights up there. I want to I see them. God's been preparing me for that because I live with all females, so... Um, uh, first of all, John and Lois had to, to back out due to a death in their family at the last moment. They were, they were a part of our team, and we just want you to know we missed you guys. John, you just don't know how much I missed you. <laughs> uh, but but we, had, we had a great, uh, great experience and uh, had a lot of fun together. We made some new friends, new, some new relationships, and God did some great, great things uh, in our lives. So I'm going to... Uh, just kind of start up giving them a little section of uh, of, of, of our trip, and uh, so each one of them is going to kind of talk about that. Uh, Janine, uh, your first missions experience, uh, how did it go for you? And then you're going to tell us about our our missionary our missionary host. Okay, so yes, it was my first trip um, out of the United States of America, if the Bahamas don't count. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it was, it was beautiful. Um, I'm not scared of flying. Actually, I say all the time I do not live in fear. So it was a fabulous flight over. Um, we got to meet David and Dana Santiago more intimately than just like hearing them, you know, here. And um, David is a trip and a half. He's funny. Um, really special people. Unfortunately, he's a gator. Um, but... <laughs> Exactly. Could see his face. Yeah. He was shocked when I pulled out my Seminole poncho. But anyway, um, we had so much fun. He was a great guy, and um, we didn't get to spend as much time with Dana because she had a son who was uh, there, and and she was a little busy with him. But um, it was great. We had a great time. They've been there 15 years, and then the other young lady, Ashley, um, she has been there a total of seven. And um, she is about to leave and come back. She's a Panama City girl. Woohoo! And um, she is going to go into missions full time. Now, I'm not all versed on the who is what and how the two years and how all that works, but um, they had a wonderful team. We loved everybody. They had the most number one greeter in the world, and her name was Whitney. She was three, she was fabulous absolutely fabulous she said hello and shook our hands welcome and we're like we got little people like that we can get that going in our church I mean she was amazing so um, we really enjoyed um, them they were wonderful Davis took us everywhere he fed us everything some of us wouldn't eat at night because we just couldn't eat anymore and um, really just wonderful people we have a little video from David that he sent to the church and to our team Hello, Generations Church. Just want to say thank you for coming and making this past week a, just, a, uh, just a tremendous blessing to our team, to our staff, to our church, and the different ministries that you minister to. 
I, I know that my life was enriched, and I trust that yours were as well. I trust that you had gone back understanding as to why Madrid, Spain, why Spain, why Europe. We need, they need Christ here, and although they don't know it, they need it. And I trust that you will continue to be praying for us as we continue to do the Lord's work. Again, I pray also that you will briefly consider doing this project every year and, uh, and that you would just continue to help us push the darkness back in the place that needs Christ. Thank you again, Pastor Brian, Sister Becky, and the whole team for all that you did. God bless you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Lord bless. Amen. That was our Florida Gator host. So he would wear his Gator, you know, his Gator outer sweater, and when we would walk up, we'd go follow the Gator. So and they, hey, they grumbled the whole time. We had to follow the Gator. Uh, one person that is missing tonight is Denise Hendricks. She does not feel well. Uh, and her, her uh, contribution to this was going to be about food and culture in Spain. So I'll just take that really quick. Spain is basically on a second shift culture, okay? So you sleep later. Things don't start as early, 8, 9 o'clock. It just doesn't happen. Things, businesses, schools start later, uh, more toward 10 o'clock. Uh, so you, you, you get to work, 9.30, 10 o'clock. Uh, you don't you don't eat lunch you know until much later. They a lot of businesses still do the afternoon siesta, so they close down from like two to five. So you go work a few hours, you close down two to five. You go home, you take a nap, you know. Uh, uh, and we want to bring the siesta back to the United States. That's what that's what we want to do. So uh, <laughs> so we're going to start that on all of our jobs. The, this week, uh, so they do uh, do the siesta. So you'll see a lot of businesses close from two to five. Then they open back up uh, at five o'clock. Now they eat dinner very late. They don't eat family dinner until nine, ten, eleven o'clock. So it's very unusual. You, we would be out in the restaurant area, and we were eating late just because we had ministry. We had a little trip to the uh, had a little trip to the hotel, uh, so we were eating late, but. But it was unbelievable to see the restaurants, 9, 10, 11 o'clock on a school night. They're crowded, full of people. And uh, so it's just a different, it's one of those cultural differences that you kind of kind of adapt to. But that was a little different. Uh, we tried uh, as much as we could, you know, the Spanish, Spanish food. One thing they do, uh, which I love, uh, is tomato bread. In the morning, they do pureed tomatoes, and you take uh, you take some bread, you put a little olive oil, a little garlic, and then you spread some tomato on that, a little salt, and it is wonderful, okay? It is wonderful. I think I had it every morning. Uh, also, you see to the right of that picture is cafe con leche. Uh, that is the Spanish coffee, so it is a, uh, it's a, it's a stiff kind of espresso mixed with milk, uh, and it's wonderful, and they serve all of their coffee in glass, you know, so uh, uh, caliente, you learn to uh, pick it up with a napkin, and uh, it's the, they just serve it, serve it that way. We also had paella, which is a very famous Spanish dish. Uh, it's a rice dish, of course, that you mix in English peas and green beans, and you can put in chicken, pork, seafood, or you can have it, have it all, fried eggs, yeah, um, Another thing we did that was kind of Spanish was churros and chocolate. Now, you know what a churro is, but right in front of that is, uh, is a, a little mug full of chocolate, okay? So, I mean, look, if you're going to blow your diet with a, with a fried sugar donut, go ahead and dunk it in coffee, I mean, in chocolate. So, uh, we had churros and chocolate, we had paella, we had tomato bread. Anything else that I'm missing that you can think of? The what? Yeah, that, they were fascinated because when you got a bottle of water, it was in a kind of a decorative bottle, you know. Uh, that was a ladies' thing. That never, uh, you know, never. I, I never even thought about it. They were collecting bottles in their hotel, and finally the hotel just threw them away. So, uh, uh, so uh, you know, anytime you go, food and culture is a little bit different. But the second shift uh, was a little bit different, and then the, the, but the food was. Uh, the, the food was great. Uh, I asked Becky to share about I See Madrid, the church, the host church that we were that we were with, doing a great job. Becky, tell us about I See Madrid. Sure, I See Madrid. Just so you know, I See stands for the International Church of Madrid, and um, I See Madrid is made up not just of Spaniards or folks that are local to Spain, born and raised there, but it is just filled with all kinds of nationalities. I mean, I don't even know that I could count the number. Of nationalities that are there. Um, so they 
when I say they translated the service in English and in Spanish, it wasn't like where we have Millie back here behind the scenes translating here for us. They did this live, right? So the whole service, you'd hear a little English, then you'd hear Spanish, English, Spanish, just back and forth. So definitely a little ping pong match that you kind of had going on the whole service. Um, but uh, I see Madrid, David and Dana Santiago, they're the pastors of the church. Their entire staff is made up of missionaries, right? Their youth pastor is a young lady <clears throat> named Amber who's come over to work for a couple of years as a missionary associate working with youth. Ashley, you've already heard Janine talk about Ashley just doing all kinds of ministry um, there. The, the one thing I would say, their church is probably not that much different from ours in that it's just all kinds of people wanting to um, learn more about Jesus, right, and wanting fellowship and wanting connection. So I think if you stepped foot in their church, you wouldn't think it was that much different, maybe a little language barrier. But other than that, they have some of the same ministries. They have ladies' ministry. Their ladies' group meets um, twice a week, uh, or excuse me, one time a week. They have two services on Sunday, and it's just a group of ladies, just like a group of our ladies would get together, and they are studying a book just like we would in a connect group here um, at Generations Church. Um, what else can I tell you? David and Dana have been there for 15 years. Um, they have done a phenomenal job. Just about three years ago, Brian was there with a team of students from Kentucky, and they ran only about 50 people in their church at that point. In this three-year span from then until now, they are running two services, um, and in those, in the first service, which is at noon, um, that service, they probably crammed 150 people into what was a former bank building. Think if you go into um, the foyer of, of your local bank, they've kind of gutted all of that out and made that a church, made that a sanctuary, and they crammed people. Their ushers have the most difficult job because they are scouting out for empty seats anywhere you can find them and people just standing. And we even noticed some people, even there was nowhere to sit. And some people might even step outside for a little while because they couldn't get, hardly get in the building. Um, so what a great problem. Their morning service is pretty traditional as far as... Um, Obviously, great worship in Spanish and in English um, and range of ages. They ha Their second service is at 5 o'clock in the afternoon after the siesta. And um, that is made up of primarily young students and young college career age folks. I would say primarily um, 30 years of age and younger. So a little bit different um, flair to that, to that service, I would say. Um, there, I would say Brian preached in both of those services. There were um, six young people who gave their hearts to the Lord that day. And that was just phenomenal um, that the Lord, he always, um, he just always shows up, right? He's the same in Spain as he is um, here in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, what else do I want to tell you about them? They are in need of being able to go to a third service. Um, but they can't go to a third service yet, and that's because they're building the former bank building that they're meeting in. There are people um, on both sides of them and on top of where they are in the facility that they rent, and they've got to be able to soundproof that building before they can actually go to a third service. Um, so um, they are in need of about 12,000 euros um, to be able to soundproof that building before they can um, go to a third service. So that's a huge need that they have um, in their body. Um, the other thing that I was just going to mention that um, we were able to bless them with, um, we always love to bring, come bearing gifts whenever you come. And we take for granted so much of the things that we have here, um, the wonderful sanctuary that we sit in. And when we take communion here at our church. We have the beautiful trays that have the bread and the juice in there, and they did not have a communion set, and so they would have to, really, they haven't had communion because they didn't have a communion set. Um, we were able to bless them with a communion set, and that morning when we, when we were there, they were able to partake in communion the very first time um, with their wonderful communion set, so that was just... Um, quite an honor for us to see that, um, you know, um, what, what a blessing that was, was to them. For, without that, they would have had to have just done it on a regular old tray. And I know that there's not like spirituality in, 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 the, in the trays themselves, but to be able to have that and to bless them with that 
That was just um, what a great thing. So wonderful church. You guys would love it. You'll have to go next time. So that's where we spent Saturday, I mean, excuse me, Sunday. Monday was a Spanish holiday, the Spanish equivalent of Thanksgiving. So, uh, you know, we were, you know, uh, kind of juggling what to do on the holiday. But we did, a, we did a prayer walk through Madrid to some key areas in Madrid. Joy, if you'll take a few moments and tell us about the, uh, the prayer walk uh, in Madrid. Well, when we went um, when we went on the prayer walk, we visited a bunch of different places throughout. Oh, there he is, um, throughout Madrid that were um, significant of, of a significant historical nature. Um, some of the things we visited were one of the things we visited was a fallen angel, which is in the very city center of Madrid. Um, there is a statue of the fallen angel that is extremely large and the only prominent piece of artwork that's really in the very center, and it is. Um, a very beautiful demonic creature um, <laughs> contorted with, you know, snakes up its things. And um, when we were walking through, um, when we were walking through and praying through that big city square, there were lots of tourist groups and we could see other groups talking about it and how pretty the artwork was. But to walk into the city center of what is basically their, uh, you know, their big, what, what, what is it called? I don't know. It's, um, it's like the central city or whatever. And it was just this huge of the devil. Um, and so um, all of us, I think actually that was one of the first things we did right when we got there. And that actually hit all of us really hard. Um, we all took a few minutes and pastor gave us all a few minutes to kind of like walk around it and just take a few minutes to pray over it. Um, that was actually really a great significant start to the trip because it showed us just how different and just how dark spiritually it is in Spain. Um, for that to be such a, a, a significant, you know, statue for them was um, something we don't think about a lot, but you know we don't we don't walk around and see the devil at Lake Ella. We don't have statues of Satan um, just hanging out at our parks. So that was um, bless you. That was um, really interesting. And then um, one of the other places that we went, um, Puerto de Sol, was where we did some of the ministry stuff actually. And um, I'm going to put these together. But Plaza Mayor and Puerto de Sol were both. We went during the day, and they were gorgeous. And there was very, it was very touristy. You saw people doing, like, magic tricks and all this stuff. And, you know, the tour guide says, hold your purse. You know, there's a lot of pickpockets. And um, when we went during the day, everybody was kind of looking around. He's telling us about this history, like, the history of each little thing. Um, but what stood out to me the most of all of that was a few hours later, when it got dark, um, Plaza Mayor turned into the place that all the homeless people were staying. And somewhere that just a few minutes ago, everyone was laughing and joking and it was very, very dark. And um, it's where we did some of our ministry, some of our homeless ministry that they're going to talk about. And um, the same thing with Puerto de Sol. When we were there and we bought all of the cool gifts we brought our kids and little things and places we ate and coffee we drank, um, a few hours later, we walked down Prostitute Row, which we had been down during the day, which had cool shops, and um, some of us were very thrilled because there were American stores that were like, look, look, it's, it's Mac. <laughs> um, and then a few hours later, it was something from a Lifetime movie. And there were just, there were two parts of Prostitute Row. I don't know if I'm just sweating or I'm just, there were two parts of Prostitute Row. The first one, um, Ashley, the person who do, is in charge of the These People Care ministry that she was talking about, um, she explained to us that there's two different parts of Prostitute Row. The first part is trafficked girls who don't have an option and who are all slaves, basically. Um, and the funny thing is when we got there, you could tell because they were Scandinavian. They were African. They were not Spaniards, none of them. And um, she told us before we went down the row to um, be sweet and, and be very gentle and timid in, our, in, in, in the way that we approach these women because some of them were being watched and we didn't want to get them in trouble. And so um, the first part we walked down was Prostitute Row. We gave, you know, little gifts out and um, to the women who would take them. Some of them, you could tell, absolutely were just, I mean, they just turned around the other way and went the other way. Um, and then they, she explained that the second part of Prostitute Row is they call Desperation Street. And it's, um, it's filled with a lot of Spanish women who um, 
were just older as much as, I mean, <laughs> they were just, instead of being looking 16 like the first street, they looked 27, 35, 45, um, all the way up to we saw a few women who were definitely great grandmothers. Um, and as bad as that is to see, um, I've been to other countries and I've seen other places. The weirdest thing for me about Spain in all of these places, every single one of them, was that during the day, just a few hours before that, they were beautiful and they were tourist attractions. And then by night, they all turned into places the devil has complete and utter free reign over. Um, It was just, um, when you go on a tourist trip, if we were all to go on a tourist trip over there, it wasn't a missions trip, we would have all been taken to the exact same places. We would have just been told a different story about it. You could see the tourist groups. Everywhere we went, there were tourist groups. People were just paying to just go see the pretty stuff. And that's what it was like the first day. And then you realize that all the pretty stuff was satanic in nature and dark, just so dark and so... At just the devil's foothold in Spain is crazy, and it only takes about three hours to see it because from the middle of the afternoon to the evening, it is a different place. And last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to pass, I promise, but um, one of the other things for me was that when we walked down Desperation Street, um, there were families having dinner, like moms, dads, a baby stroller on one of the corners, and three feet from them, there were prostitutes. And the truth is the... The culture of that place is so morally corrupt that it didn't bother anyone. It doesn't interrupt your evening or your appetizers to have streets and streets of trafficked young girls being sold right beside your dinner. Not crummy restaurants, nice, nice restaurants, expensive, pretty restaurants. So for me, that just spoke so strongly to the overall culture of why Spain because Spain is in desperate, dark, like they're just in desperate need of light. Everything from dinner to afternoon walks are super dark. So. Yeah, thank you, Steve. One of the cool things we did, we visited International Media Ministries, uh, Summers of God Ministry in, uh, in Madrid. Dawn, uh, it was an interesting day. She's our techie person. Tell us a little bit about International Media Ministry. What That's we, why you told me to talk that's about That's right. <laughs> And I'm actually controlling all the photos by here as well. (laughs) Um, So, yes, we went to IMM. That's International Media Ministries. It's in a very lovely big building. That's where we got to eat paella for the first time. They greeted us very nicely. Um, They have a whole team of people there from around the world. I talked to a man from Britain. I talked to another lady from from the U.S. Um, So they're all different ministries with all different gifts. And what IMM does is that they produce um, all kinds of videos to either bring out the gospel or training to train missionaries. Um, So this is the picture of us in front of the building, actually. It's a very beautiful building. Um, So they took us throughout the building. They had studios set up. They had very high-tech software. They had this whole room full of equipment that I didn't even know what it all was. Um, But what they do is they produce videos, so they take the Bible and bring it to life. They were working on a series of women in the Bible, and I think they were currently working on Ruth at the time we were there, that they were going through the book of Ruth and telling her story. They had actors and scenes. They had a green screen that they would stand in front of and do all of the shoots. And then they had people that would edit it, add music, and then they had people that would add subtitles and put it in many, many, many different languages some of the even smaller Arabic languages, they would translate all these videos in, and then they would put them on social media. And everything goes on social media, and everybody sees it. So th- the message, the, the Bible is getting out to these countries in their language through video. Um, and it was very interesting to know that ministry doesn't just happen with missionaries going out in the field, but that you can have a gift for technology or editing music and still bring the gospel to the world. All of these people had studied in um, technological colleges and universities, had film degrees and music, editing, all kinds of degrees, and they would be there um, editing these videos. They even had a whole variety of costumes. Um, I was uh, standing at the wrong place at the wrong time, and they just threw all this stuff on me. (laughs) Um, But they actually had handmade costumes from those time periods for every character in the Bible. It was a whole closet full of everything that I'm sure Pastor Bo would love. 
because um, it was just full of everything that you could get, real swords that really looked authentic to really bring the, the, the Bible to life, all of the stories. And they had a whole closet full of old VHSs that they were working on digitizing so that they could have all of these videos for the future. Um, one of the gifts that we brought IMM were these tiny little contraptions. They were about the size of your cell phone. And what they were, they were Wi-Fi transmitters. So they explained to us is that there are many refugees that are fleeing their countries, and many times they're only leaving with maybe their cell phone and their clothing. So while they're in a new country or maybe on the bus, they could uh, take out their phone and connect to this device, which looks like a Wi-Fi signal. So you take out your phone, you connect to this Wi-Fi signal, and it takes you to the Hope Box. So you don't get on the Internet. You actually get on the Hope Box, and the Hope Box is filled with material in your language. It has an introduction to who is Jesus, what is the Bible. Um, it has those kinds of videos that IMM produces, so you can see it visually, see some of the stories, and it even has the entire Bible in your language on this device. So if you're a refugee in the Middle East fleeing your country and you're sitting on a bus for three hours with nothing to do but read the Bible, you may end up reading some of it or reading some of the materials on the Hope Box. Um, so we give, gave maybe 30 or something of these devices to IMM because we realized for them to buy them, they would have to go through customs and delivery. It was just way too expensive. And for us, it's only $30 a piece to buy these devices and bring them over. So they said they would put them on buses or sometimes people would take them in their pocket into the countries where they could possibly be killed for bringing those devices into the country. So there are other missionaries doing those kind of work, and those are missionaries that are not written down in the books. We can't find them. Did I cover everything? Yeah, that's good. Wonderful. Uh, one, one thing, they're having great success in the Arabic world when they put this stuff on their computer because you can do it privately from your home. So they're getting a lot of access of Arabs that are very curious about the gospel, and in the privacy of their own home, they are going to websites. They are going to uh, videos produced by IMM. So... As Don said, not, not everybody that's doing something great for God is a preacher behind the pulpit, but there are people with great video and technology gifts that God is using in a great way right now. Another ministry that uh, we participated with was Kilometer Zero at Puerto del Sol, and Angie's going to tell you about that. And let me just tell you, anytime you take Angie, there's just fun and laughter that just follows you around. And drama, okay? So, uh, Angie, uh, just take a moment. Tell us about our evening on the streets with Kilometer Zero. Um, well, first, I just want to thank everybody that helped me get around with their elbows. Whatever I could grab, you know, in the time, whatever's coming up, I just thank them for being my eyes. So, now I'm going to the ground. Okay, I'm going to talk about Kilometer Zero, which is the middle of Madrid. Um, we uh, went uh, to to up in a building where it was rescue mission, which is for uh, people that have uh, been in slave trafficking or, or sex trafficking, and they're there in that building. They're raising money with jewelry that they have on and doorstep. You want to read that, Ryan? Nuevo. I don't know how to say that. It's that. That's the part of the. Uh, It means new beginning <clears throat> is a safe home for women at risk, many of whom are victims of human trafficking and prostitution. They make all the jewelry by hand, and all the proceeds go toward their restoration project. So that was, we were, we were in that coffee room, and then we went in another room where we prayed, and we sang, and we did worship first. And Don translated, a lady was saying scripture, reading scripture over what we were about to do was on the red box, which was outside in the Puerto de Sol big plaza where people are walking everywhere fast, fast, walking fast. And we had, um, we had, we had, uh, we passed out flyers in English and Spanish um, that told about what, what was happening in the red box. And there was a young lady um, and she has done this for years, and she had her guitar, and then they had rhythm instruments, and they would sing and draw a crowd, and then um, then somebody would testify and give a testimony. And there was a young lady that I think she could have been a preacher, um, and she was awesome. And Pastor also got up there and told his testimony, and, you know, it was with crowds. And then uh, we would, uh, if, if somebody wanted to hear about God, you know, and, and – 
it says in what I was reading um, was that, you know, in America, if somebody gets up, like, you know, up on a platform, they think, oh, my gosh, he's another preacher. What is he going to say, you know? And they just pass him by. But here, um, you know, people are more drawn to stop and listen. And there were several people that did. And I just, I think it was probably my, one of my first experiences of, of passing out. I say flyers, they're not flyers. Tracks, thank you. Tracks, you know, and some people would just not even look at you. Uh, some people would, would, I mean, I just hold it out and they just keep walking, you know, and not even, you know, and smile. Some would smile. I might saw the smile, I might not have, but anyway. Um, and I guess that's pretty much it. And, and I, you know, I just was thankful that I got to go and experience what a mission field is like. And it's like they were saying it's not just um, behind a pulpit, you know, that Pastor Santiago has a great team, but he needs even more people to do what he's doing. You know, um, I was tired by the end of the week. I don't know about y'all, but, I mean, we went all week and just, you know, but it was just an awesome experience, and I'd go back again. Amen. And I, I want to commend Angie. Of course, she's uh, legally blind, but she didn't let that be an obstacle to her going. And uh, so, Angie, my hat's off to you. I know there might have been some apprehension on that, but you pushed through, and uh, she just kept us laughing and smiling. And uh, so uh, uh, we, we had a great time with Angie. Doris, take a moment. We spent one evening in Plaza Mayor with the homeless and uh, did some uh, outreach on Prostitute Row. Tell us, tell us about that that evening. First of all, I'd like to say there's no excuse to go on a, Angie's, Angie's, Angie went on this missions That's trip right. with this. There's no excuse whatsoever That's for right. anybody not to go on a missions right. trip. Anyway, um, I was supposed to talk about the prostitution and the homeless. Um, Joy talked about the prostitution, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but what stood out for me, um, I've done a lot of the homeless ministry here, you know, in the states, but I've never seen, I've never seen anything like, you know, prostitution road like, like we saw. Um, I don't, I just like, I don't even understand what trafficking is. And I asked her, I said, how come they have to be here? How come they're staying? They said they steal their passports and they threaten to kill their families and they threaten to kill them, so they can't leave, you know. And these were young girls. Um, you couldn't, and I just, I just admire the TP, the These People Care ministry that Ashley does because a lot of these on the street, all you can do is hand them something and give it to them and keep going. You can't stop and you can't really minister to them, but they're building relationships with them in case they do ever want to, you know, come and talk to them. But that takes a lot of perseverance to go every single week, you know, and, and do this for three years in a row and just keep you know, the, the, I just was amazed by that. And then when we went to um, the one where you could actually talk to them, I forgot to bring my bag. But one thing that they're doing is they're handing out these bags and they're giving them to the prostitutes to paint on. And if they paint on them and give them back to Ashley, Ashley pays them to do that. And to me, that's a way of saying to them, this is something you're worth more than just selling your body. Even though that's what they have to do at this moment, they, they, we all, I don't know about all of us, but some of us bought one of their bags and um, gave us the name of the prostitute. Some of them signed their name so we can pray for them. But it's funny how he asked me to um, talk about that. But before we ever left Tallahassee, I, this scripture just every single day I would read this and I would pray this over the prostitutes. But it says, do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear grace. You will not be humiliated. Humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. And I was able to pray with three of the prostitutes. And that's what I prayed over them is that, you know, God is your husband and he's the Lord Almighty. And, you know, just to be with them and to just protect them. But then we went and did the homeless bags and we had, we had taken all the stuff to prepare the bags there and we prepared them and there was like socks and shampoo and hand sanitizer um and one thing that janine got was uh earplugs and i thought you know i've never i've done a lot of the homeless stuff i've never seen earplugs in a bag and i didn't think anything of it but i was like it's just kind of weird <laughs> we handed them out and this one guy got so excited and we're like what and i don't think i don't think he spoke english and don told us that he was so excited over having earplugs so that he could sleep at night and not hear the noise out on the street 
And he even wanted more, you know, and that was amazing. Just to see him when you hand him a sandwich to gobble it up and then not have any more for other people, you know, but that, that, was, that was amazing. We, we took about 200 pounds of supplies over there and for the various ministry. Of course, Dana's doing a selfie with the uh, man on the street there. Uh, uh, but we took 200 pounds of supplies. It's $100 a bag, extra bag to take over there. But it was worth it because it, it helped extend our ministry just, just a little bit there. So thanks, Doris. Dana, you, everybody had stretching opportunities in uh, Spain. Dana probably had the biggest stretching opportunity uh, uh, she uh, not only participated in one of the ministries, but she led uh, the ministry at the Oasis Center. We did a medical information clinic. So, Dana, uh, take a moment. Dana was our crier on our trip, as you see, and uh, which is fine. Dana, tell us a little bit about the Oasis Center. Tell us about the uh, medical information clinic that, that we did, the supplies that we, uh, that we brought to those ladies. Um, <laughs> just saw my little friend. Um, we did um, a medical clinic, the Oasis Center, and um, I knew that I was going to do it, and probably about Tuesday night, my throat started getting sore, and Wednesday, I started sounding like a man, <laughs> and so Thursday, the clinic came up, and um, um, I really did sound like a man, So, but Wednesday night, all the girls prayed for me um, at the hotel, and so that I would have a voice. Um, and I, you know, I had a voice um, enough to to talk and have the class. But when we first pulled up, um, it we were going down this little cobblestone road, and um, the van just stopped. And the pastor said, "Okay, everybody, get out." And I'm like, "Here?" <laughs> because when, on one side it was just, you know, where you could see the tents and canopies and everything where the homeless people were making shelter, and and then on the other side there was a building, but it had like this garage door that lifted up and I'm thinking this is kind of sketchy but we all got out and went in and I noticed that they would let us in and then they would lock the door and pull the curtains mm -hmm. and I'm like what is that about and so I was thinking um, how are the ladies supposed to come in so we were getting set up and um, getting all of our supplies out and in a few minutes the the ladies started coming in with their children, and they would let them in and then lock the door behind them. And I'm like, where are we? But um, everybody was very friendly. Um, the ladies were very friendly. And, um, you know, everyone is, you know, even whatever background they have, everyone, you know, wants love. And, um, you know, once the ice broke, you know, you started talking to them. Um, they had an you know, someone that would um, speak for them, um, translate, and it was, it was very unnerving, you know, at first, and then everything was very calm. Um, they would smile, you know, I would smile at them, and everything was, you know, was fine. Um, went over everything as far as health issues, um, you know, simple things as far as, you know, what we had in the kit, um, you know, brushing your teeth, you know, how to help take care of the kids, um, nutrition, um, just everything that a mom would want to know, you know, for her babies. And um, they all had children. Some of them had brought them with them. And, um, you know, I just was concerned about the conditions, you know, that they had to come through just to get there. Because, um, you know, when we were leaving, you know, there, the pastor that was running it, the missionary that was running it there, um, Mark Cannon, he was, you know, he was telling us that he's had to ask some of the drug dealers there on the street if they could move down a block or so because the women were, you know, were worried about trying to get there. Um, they didn't want to have to come, you know, bringing their children through that. And, um, you know, just want to come and get some help, you know, once a week that they have it there on Thursday. And, um, you know, they were just doing what they had to do, you know, for their families. And it was just... Um, it was very touching, and there was one lady when she was leaving that had made a comment um, to the to one of the ladies that helps to run it. Um, that you know, she said that was a breakthrough um, that she had been praying with, and um, she thought that you know something was starting to touch her heart. So you know, they are making some 
some leeway there. Um, you know, something is, is touching their hearts. They're doing, you know, something right. And they just, um, they just need more help. You know, they need prayer. They're getting a new building, um, you know, in a safer area. But they just, um, you know, they have a long way to go. And, you know, just pray for them. The Oasis Center, um, is, as Dana said, it's in, it's in the immigrant part of Madrid. So you have the beautiful parts, and you go, and it looks like almost like a different world. But it's a ministry to immigrants, and most of them are Muslim. So all the ladies that we had that morning were Muslim. They wore their scarves. Because they were Muslim, uh, myself and Pastor Dave, we weren't even allowed in the building. So as soon as we dropped them off, I didn't even get a chance to coach our team a little bit. I had to go and, uh, and just leave it with them. But we left them uh, with hygiene, nutrition bags. We took all kinds of uh, printed materials in Spanish to help them. And uh, so the Oasis Center, really it's like a community center, but it's run by Christians just to develop relationships over a long period of time with these people. And Dana, her team, they did a great job. Um, Wendy smiled through the whole trip, had a great time. But the biggest smile was on the last day we, uh, we worked with, we worked with uh, IC Madrid in their after-school uh, ministry for kids and uh, Wendy, a teacher at heart and by education, tell us a little bit about that afternoon. Oh, yay, there they are. That was so much fun. Um, they had only done it for two weeks, so this was the third Thursday that they had done it. And what they do is for two hours, they come in and they have little centers, and they came in and they had four different rugs, and so each each child knew exactly what rug to go to and they started off with some singing and then they each had to go to the different center and there was like a snack center and then Dana and Joy they had a lot of fun at their center because it was <laughs> creative play so Joy's inner Fisher Price came out and she was setting it no that was you that was you but in the blocks and so and then Janine had the coloring and then there were and then there was um, Janine and Doris had coloring, and then there was snacks. We had to sh um, Becky set up all the snacks. Pastor Brian almost got caught in that. I go, okay, the kids are coming. He goes, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was two other centers that I'm not thinking. Yeah. The finger puppets, yes. And then in the television, that was one. And then there was one where they got to actually build the trucks and stuff that we had sent over. But what was so neat was. Um, the majority of these kids were from Muslim homes, but the way they get them in is they want them to learn English. So I can do that. I don't know. I, um, Ace always makes fun of me because I learned two things in high school. I could quattro sonjos tigres tu. And that means, how old are you? And I got to say that over and over again. And they all knew what I meant. <laughs> so, um, and then they'd go, you from the Estados Unidos? And i go, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so but the whole reason the Muslim families want their children to come is to learn English. But what is so neat is they don't care what you teach them in English. So at my table, I was doing numbers. But what they're doing at the end when they bring all the kids back together is they're giving them a Bible story. And they're teaching them about, you know, their Lord Jesus Christ and, and our Lord. And what's so neat about that is that we're seeing these little girls at this age, and hopefully, by the grace of God, they're not going to end up being the same girls that are going to the Oasis Center in like 20 or 30 years. That's my prayer. And um, But it was just so much fun. And, you know, whether it's Spain or the United States, kids are just the same. And, like, when they saw the camera, they're like, ooh, selfie, selfie. And I'm like, ooh, okay, my daughter is going to be so embarrassed, but let's go. <laughs> Because, um, but it was just so much fun, and um, I really did. I was looking forward to that day, although I had a lot of fun. I was very excited when Thursday came, so, so yeah. Check, well, there you go. Uh, one thing that we, we talked about when we debriefed at night, um, um, sometimes you can pick up a racial stereotype that our team really just went around the table and confessed that we had toward Muslims, okay? And understandably so. 
Uh, but we saw, we just saw moms that loved their kids, and our whole team was just impacted. You can just, you can look on the news, you can make a racial judgment based on what you see on the news, but we just saw wonderful people. We saw moms that are just concerned about their kids, and really God did a work in our heart, you know, in, in that. So I just I remembered that moment and just wanted to, to share that. All right, we're closing out. Everybody's got 30 seconds, and I'm going to hold you to it, okay? Uh, um, how, what did you take home? How are you changed? How are you different um, from this trip? So, uh, Dawn, we'll start down there with you, and we'll just work our way, work our way down. There you go. How, what, what impacted you? How are you, how are you different? <sighs> yes. Okay. How am I different? Um, thinking about Spain, I just thought, well, I have to translate everything. Um, so that was always a big challenge for me that God give me the words that I need to say because I had to say everything in Spanish um, for different things. Um, but knowing Spanish and going to Spain, it was a totally different story because they don't speak like I speak. I speak Mexican Spanish and they don't speak like that. So what really stuck with me was just the people that were there. They, they're just the same as we are here. They're just the same as my students, I teach English as a second language, so I come across students from 20, 30 different languages and countries all the time. Um, but just understanding that in Spain, what they're doing is they're trying to love on the people. They're trying to show the love of God by serving them, doing the Oasis Center, doing this kids program, serving the women on the streets. It's just showing the love of Jesus, not necessarily giving the gospel at that time, but showing just the love of Jesus. And it's something that I kept with me as I have students in my classroom here in Tallahassee that are Muslim, that are from different religions, that as a teacher myself, I can also show the love of Jesus without having to share the gospel. And they know that I'm a Christian. They know I go to church. They know I went to Madrid on a mission trip. And right when I got back into my classroom, my students were saying, teacher, show us all the pictures. Tell yeah. us about Madrid. And I got to share with my class here in Tallahassee exactly what I did. And it was wonderful. That's good. Becky, what's your takeaway? How are you different? Um, I've always known that missions was the, was the heartbeat uh, of God, right? He wants all of his children all around the world to, to come to a saving knowledge of him. Um, and I, I've been on tons of missions trips, and, and missions is in my heart. Um, I think, though, I was reminded again how great the need was for missionaries and um, the sacrifice that missionaries make. Right, for going across whatever country they're serving in, leaving their family, David and Dana, leaving grandchildren and all their children here in the States um, to obey the call, uh, the call that God has placed on their life as missionaries. And I think for me, I was just reminded that um, when I dedicated my children, when they were little babies um, here in the States and said, Lord, they're your children. Thank you for this gift. And um, Lord, they're yours. And I, I want them to love you. And, Lord, whatever you want to call them to do in life, um, I, I'm okay with that. And I was reminded of that commitment um, this week in, or last week in Spain that um, I committed to the Lord that I would let my children go wherever. And, and my prayer is, um, Lord, the need is great for missionaries. And David and Dana and other missionaries, they will come home at some point. They will be too old to do that. And, and there's a baton that needs to be passed to somebody. And Lord, let it be my children um, who respond to the call um, to, to be a missionary, wherever that may be, but let them be there to um, pick up that baton and, and carry the gospel. Yeah. In Spain, the, the number of evangelicals is 0.2%, 0.2%. So the prayer of the missionary and the pastors there is, Lord, help us to get to 1%. 1%, that's their, that's their prayer. That's the desperate need there. So we're 0 for 2 on people trying to stay within 30 seconds. So, uh, so my two things, Pastor, <laughs> are that I, I'm really selfish. Like, I thought I was yeah. not because yeah. I don't, I'm not concerned about who's wearing what or what yeah. kind of purse they have or but that kind of thing. But yet I am very selfish and that I was very aware of that there. They live very simply and um, I'm just a very selfish person. So that was one thing. And the second thing was that I do totally look at missionaries completely different now that we've had a, we've created a relationship yeah. with Santiago. Yeah, yeah. Wendy? Um, I'm like Becky too. I want to be able to, um, I want to 
stir in everyone's heart the importance of missions. I used to be, let's take care of America. And I'm just being kind of authentic with you right now. But there is a whole big world out there that I didn't really know about. And um, and seeing that. And if it does, if I have to say goodbye to my children to go ahead and do that, um, I'm going to do it with a very sad heart. <laughs> but I would, I feel <laughs> I feel like God is preparing me for that, but I, I do. I just want to look at the buddy barrel and just think of all the little people out there that need to learn about Jesus. Yeah. Dana, Brent, where's Brent? Um, I've never really thought about all the work that missionaries do until I witnessed it last week, and you have to be um, very unselfish and um, a very hard worker. And it, it takes a, a lot of work, and um, I don't honestly know that I could keep up with all that. Um, you have to be very, very, very dedicated, um, and I really learned learned that last week. Um, they're very special people, yeah. and I will definitely give when it's Missionary Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that's great, Joey. How you're different? What do you what'd you take away? Um, actually. Um, so I've been on a few other missions trips um, all to South America, greeted by very warm, friendly, kind, awesome people who walk 20 miles to go to church. Um, the difference is, is that in Spain, there's none of that. And um, I think the biggest thing I can make with was responsibility. Um, none of us see it as our responsibility, but it is. It is your responsibility. Um, to give to speed the life, to do B BGMC, Buddy Barrels. I had no idea they bought all the cars and the equipment and all the wonderful things. Last night, we, I, we went around the table and I asked them all this question. You know, what, what's your takeaway? How are you different? And there was great emotion. Great emotion. Uh, not just because they're ladies, because when we were in Honduras on the last night when we completed the building and our men were weeping as well. So I said, 
anything, and I would just say to you, this is not an unusual, it, this might be an unusual emotion to us, but it's the way our Heavenly Father feels all the time. And we're just getting a little sensitivity to His heart. When we get a little closer to brokenness, we get a little closer to people who don't know Christ, we get to a country that doesn't even have 1%, 1%, evangelical and we weep just for a week or so in different countries but that's the way the Heavenly Father feels all the time and we just sometimes missions trips just give you that little exposure to that so I want to thank these ladies they did a tremendous job they worked really hard they gave they saved to get on the trip uh, the supplies that we took uh, I want to invite you at some point if you feel like you know maybe that's that's for me I really think missions trips can help in the spiritual development of, of, of the evangelistic part of our hearts. You know, sometimes we're a little cold, we're a little hard in this area, and sometimes uh, that that part of your heart can just be shattered, and you can just see things new. I think we just see through a new a new prism. So I want to close in prayer. Just want to want to pray tonight specifically for Spain, for San, the Santiago's, and uh, we're gonna keep good connections with them and just ask the Lord, it's the prayer of the church would you give us 1%, that's heartbreaking to me, that's just heartbreaking but let's just do that uh, Doris, would you just lead us in prayer tonight and as we close and just pray for Spain, the Santiago's and, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed Open up our minds, God, to what you are doing all over the world. And we ask you in this and your